Uh, we're in our series, which we're calling Let's Go, and we've been talking about some critical values, values that we need to adopt as individuals, as followers of Jesus, and uh, values that, it, is, that we're mirroring as a church as well. So uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the value of love and the importance of that. Last week, we talked about authenticity and um, why it's important to be authentic, why it's important to, to be the real person that God has called you to be. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to be a generous person. And we're not talking about money. We're not talking about you know, giving. We're talking about a generous heart, how to build a generous heart. Uh, somebody say the word generous. All right, it's an important word for us today as we look at uh, this as a value. And I, and I hope that when we finish today, that you'll have a better understanding of what it means to be a generous human being, uh, emotionally, relationally, as well as through generosity of the gifts that God has given you. Uh, so let me just uh, start this way. Um, do you ever ask yourself questions? I mean, if you do that, be careful about talking to yourself loudly, because some pi people probably call the authorities. But you ever ask yourself questions? I mean, do you wake up in the morning and ask yourself, hey, you know, I, I, I hope, will today be a day that really brings life to its culmination? Have you ever asked that? I mean, do you, do you ask yourself the question about, what can I do to, to have a better relationship with my kids? Is that, is that a conversation piece? You know, lately, the question I've been asking myself is, why did I get out of the chair and now I'm in the living room? You know, you ever, you ever had one of those where you just don't even know what's going on from that standpoint? Well, I, I think it's important to ask ourselves questions, and, and questions do a lot of things. They, they stir the emotion inside of us. They challenge us. They call us to wrestle with things that are on our minds, but more importantly, um, as we work towards stretching ourselves for life's goals. So here's a question I want us to lead off today because I think it's really important, and that question is, why do I have so much? Now, maybe you don't ask yourself that question. Maybe, maybe you don't never really wrestle with that, but I think that's a great question for us to start off with today. Why do I have so much? Um, do you ever find yourself asking yourself that? You know, a lot of people, I was reading in the paper, a lot of people bought Powerball tickets. One person, or at least we think one ticket, don't know how many people chipped in, but somebody bought a ticket in Michigan for a billion dollars. You know, we, we play games of chance like that, and, and, and we, in, we invest money we don't have and time that we can't keep, and we, we put it toward things like that with the hopes that all of a sudden it'll just make our life different. It'll, it'll bring a big change and that we'll have nothing to worry about. But my concern is that, that when we do things like that, we're, we're focusing on the things of the world. You know, uh, if you ever thought about, you know, if you bought one of those tickets, what were you thinking? Like, hey, I'm going to buy a sports car, or I'm going to buy a house on the beach, or I'm going to spend money like nobody's ever spent it before. And when I talk to people that, that, that play those kinds of games, what they're hoping for is that one big win and how it will increase their personal level of living. But few of us, I think, um, have as much as we want. I think if we were to sit down and look at our assets and we would look at the things that we have, very few of us would say, I have everything that I want, and everything that I want is, is fulfilling in the things that I need. But I want us today to kind of move aside from that for a second, and instead of looking at possessions and instead of looking at things like that, I want us to really start thinking about what it means to develop a heart of generosity. Because here's the bottom line. The odds are that you have more today than your parents had when they were your age. The odds are that, that you have more than two-thirds of the world's population. If you were to think about that, it's probably more like three-fourths of the world's population. If you live in America, we have probably three-fourths more of wealth than anyone else in the entire world. But yet our heart yearns for, for so many more things. So, so we have to slow down. We have to slow down. We have to think this through. We've got to ask ourselves some important questions. We've got to wrestle with it. And, and the challenge is, is that we live in a consumer-driven environment. And, and that consumer-driven environment is, is everything comes at us telling us that we're not good enough. You know, your hair is not long enough, or you don't have enough hair, so you need to buy this to grow hair. Or your hair is the wrong color, but if you buy this, it'll color it that way. Or here's something to remove the hair that you don't want. And I mean, all sorts of, I don't know why I'm talking about hair, but, but all sorts of things that, that come around. The world bombards us with things that we're not good enough, so therefore we need to acquire more. But as long as we're on that quest to require more, we're missing out. As long as we're thinking about it's that next purchase, it's that next thing, it's that next release, it's that next app, it's this next thing that we need to have, 
we're missing out, I think, on something big of what God wants us to see. That's why I want to take us directly to this passage in Luke where Jesus is talking and sharing a very important parable. This is a parable maybe you've heard before, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, uh, hopefully it'll open your eyes. If you have heard it today, I want you to open your ears in a different way, and I want you to hear it in the way in which it's being read. I'm reading from the message translation. Speaking to the people, Jesus went on and said these words, take care, protect yourself against the least bit of greed. All right? So two sentences in, Jesus is already acknowledging the challenge that's before us, is we need to protect ourselves from something called greed. Somebody say greed. Greed is the thing that Jesus says we've got to be careful about. He says life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. So Jesus is saying that, that we need to switch our way of thinking and to not think that because we have a lot or because we want to acquire a lot, that that's what success means in life. He brings it back home and he says, even when you have a lot, life is not defined by what you have. Then he told them this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He talked to himself, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Those of us that have, at some point in time of our lives had three car garages, why'd we buy a three car garage house? Because two wasn't enough. We had too much stuff, okay? So he's talking about, imagine these barns. My, my barn isn't big enough for the harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. So notice it's plural. So he doesn't just have one barn. He has multiple barns. And I'm going to build bigger ones. So he's going to take what he has, and he's going to multiply the size of that so that he can store even more. Then I'll gather in all my grain and all my goods, and I'll say to myself, self, you've done well. You've got it made, and then you can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. And just then, uh-oh, God showed up. Sometimes it's good news God shows up. Sometimes it's not good news God shows up. Fool, tonight you die, the Lord said to the man, and your barn full of goods, who gets it? This is what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. Okay, so you see what's going on here? So, so it wasn't the fact that the man... Had, had things, or it wasn't the fact that he wasn't successful or was successful. The fact was, was he was putting his entire life into the success of what he thought he had. So here's the question. Why has God provided you with more than you need? You ever ask yourself that question? You know, some of us, I don't know if we ever asked that question, or not, we've never really looked at life that way. Why has God provided you more than you need? All right, what do you need? Well, you need to be able to feed your family. You need to be able to have a roof over your head. I mean, all the, the necessities of the things that are there. I'm not talking about a big house, but you need a roof over your head. You, you don't need gourmet meals. You just need meals. You need uh, medical care. You need those kinds of things. But what, what about over that? But, but why has God provided you more than what you need? And that's an interesting question for us to ask today. You know, for some of us, it's an uncomfortable question. We, we listen to that, and all of a sudden, we're starting to take inventory and feeling guilty about what we have. And before you do that, don't, don't go there. I, I'm trying to take us into a, a different place as we're learning about generosity today, and I'm going to explain a little bit later why having what you have is not a sin. It actually is, is a huge blessing. So, so you get to this point, and you wonder, you wonder why, why not wonder why I have enough? Why, don't, why do I have enough? Why do I have more than what I need? And ask yourself what God wants to do with that. What might God be up to in, in, in providing you more than you need? Here's a couple of thoughts, okay? The first one is maybe God's provided you more than you need so that you can pass it on to your children. Now, that might be and it might not be. I mean, sometimes when we give money to people, unexpected money to people, if we're not careful, if we haven't built a strong foundation around them, it's not a good thing. In fact, when I counsel kids and I counsel adult children and all, I've never heard any of them say, well, my unhappiness began the day my parents gave me a lot of money. It just doesn't go that way. So we have to be careful. So did God give you um, more than you need so that you can pass it on to your kids? Did God provide an abundance for you so that you don't worry? Some of us think that if I, if I just had a little bit more, I wouldn't worry. Have you ever thought that way? If I just had a little bit, if I just had $10,000 more, if I just had $100 more, I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't be worried about this or that or the other thing. 
As I talk to friends of mine that are uh, trust and wills attorneys and investors and all, they tell me all the time that their clients are constantly worrying, especially with market fluctuations. And the least little change they're calling their, their, their clients are calling them worrying about what it is, their nest egg and what they have. So, so having a lot doesn't eliminate worry in your life by any means. You see, the cost associated with maintaining our lifestyle is the trick. Because we're kind of told in America that, that, that we live by the old American concept that, that, that we need to have as much as we possibly can. And with credit cards the way that they are, it allows us to live beyond our means in a snap of a finger. So what happens in these instances is, is that we lose sight and we're not creating what I call margin. The margin between what God has blessed us with, the, the life that we're living, and the margin that's in between is what's left over. So is, so is God trying to help you raise your standard of living? Is that why God has blessed you with more? Has God said, I want you to, to raise your standard of living, and this is why I'm giving you so much more that you can have? I'm not sure about that. Because the more we have, the more we spend. The more you make, the more you spend, as the old adage goes. So the challenge becomes, as we look at this, is that maybe what we have to look at is our lifestyle. The lifestyle that we're chasing, the lifestyle that we're developing, are we living within our means or are we living beyond our means? Are we living beyond our abilities? And like I said earlier, when we start living beyond our means, when we start living beyond our abilities, it narrows, if not eliminates, our ability to have any margin. We're, we're convinced that we need these necessities of life. But the bottom line is, when we make our choices of paying our Netflix bill, our credit card bill, our cell phone bill, we're making choices about how we'll spend the wealth that God gives to us. And the question today is, what are you going to do with what God has blessed you with? And have you ever asked, has God blessed me with more than I need? Here's number four. Perhaps you've been provided with extra income so you can retire early. I've had a couple of friends in my lifetime who retired extremely early. One was uh, very successful in business, and she was at a point where her company was able to, to buy her out, and she could retire at an early age. And instead of putting her life away on the golf course, she answered a, a, a call, in a sense, to, to go and to be involved in ministry. She volunteers her time today at several churches. And what she's doing is, is she's pouring her life with her gifts and her abilities that way because God provided her a way to retire early. Another friend of mine um, came out of the IBM Corporation, and he was also a great entrepreneur, was, was part of some of the early days of Einstein Bagels and some other companies that you might know about. And at the age of 42, he retired. And he got involved with Patty and me as we planted a church in Central Florida, he and his wife and their family. And he just had this uh, huge gift of giving. And he, he was exploring this call to ministry that, that maybe God had him retire early and his wealth came so he could retire so he could go into ministry. And the more we talked about it, we concluded that, that God wasn't calling him into ordained ministry, but God was calling him into the ministry of generosity. And so what did he do? He went back to work so that he could earn more money. Not so that he could live into a bigger barn syndrome, but so that he could earn money on the gift that God gave to him so he could give that money away for the kingdom's purpose. So these are valid questions that we have to ask ourselves. Both of these persons asked, why did God give me more than I need? And I think it's a huge question for us to ask today. When I was growing up, my nana, my grandmother, uh, loved to bake cookies. Anybody else's nana bake great, uh, cookies? Anybody else? No? One? One other person? Okay. Your nanas didn't bake? <laughs> Well, my Nana baked, and, and uh, she always baked cookies. And the lesson that she taught me in life was that whenever she gave me two cookies and one of my brothers would come in the room and they didn't have one, she didn't say, quick, eat those cookies before they can snatch one out of your, out of your cold hands. She said, share, right? She said, share with one of your brothers. And I was always lucky because there was only one brother who would ever come in because if all three of my brothers came in at the same time, we would have had to have broken them into pieces and I was never good at fractions. So, so she always said, when you have more than enough, you need to share. And it made me think about how, how that lesson that my Nana taught me so many years ago, and I take that back and I kind of put a God perspective on it. And imagine God looking down at all of us and saying, I've blessed you with this, I've blessed you with this, I've given an overabundance to all of you and all these things, and over here is a group of people that have nothing. Can you imagine what warms God's heart when God sees those of us 
who have received more to be able to help out those who have had nothing or who are in need with zero. That's the kind of thing that generosity builds. Jesus said, give to the one who asks you. Don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And you see, that's what breaks the bounds of greed in our life. A couple other things I've learned in life, and that is that, that guilt is conquered by confession, anger is conquered by forgiveness, and greed is conquered by what? Generosity. Whenever you are feeling greedy, the only way to break, break the bounds of greed is to become generous, is to turn that inside out and begin to give in a different way. So whether you think that, that you have extra, then, then you need to give generously. So whether you think you've been given extra or not, you have. So God says to give generously. You've got to give to the point that it forces you to adjust your lifestyle. If you're unwilling to change your lifestyle so you can create margin, so you can be generous in the way that God wants you to do, Jesus would call that greed. If you, if you found yourself consuming to the point that you have little or nothing left to give after you have earned and spent and you have no margin, Jesus would call that greed. If you find yourself saving everything that you have and never blessing anyone else and creating that margin but never doing anything with it, guess what? Jesus would call that greed because we're called to be people who are generous and that we are cultivating a generous heart. Greed is evidenced not by how you feel, but by what you do. So we might not feel generous, but when we are generous, that is how we are seen in the eyes of God. So think about it, if you're, how, how do you become a generous person? Think about like you're adopting a new exercise regimen, okay? You can't just think about it. You actually have to do something. You have to start eating better. You have to start walking more. You have to start lifting weights, doing yoga, um, whatever it is that you, biking, whatever, whatever the things are, you have to be engaged. You can't wait and say, I wait until my heart has changed. God moves in you the moment you change your heart. So the moment you make the decision to become more generous, God immediately moves in and God chooses to change your heart. And that's why the scriptures tell us that God loves a cheerful giver because it's a transformation that has happened within you. It's not my advice, it's the scriptural advice. Give until you're cheerful. Have you ever met that person when, they're, when it comes time to, to bless their church? Ah, I gotta write out another check to the church. <laughs> you ever met that person? Ah, oh, there's another homeless person. Ah, I gotta give more money for that. <laughs> We're gonna do that. That's not the cheerful heart. That is saying that it's more important for you to have than for you to give so that others might receive. Let me, let me answer another question this morning because I get asked this a lot. To be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian, to be someone who, who loves the Lord, does it mean that you can't have any wealth? Does it mean that you can't have anything, that you have to live, you know, give everything away? The answer is no. We see all throughout the Bible that God blesses his people in tremendous ways. The sin of greed comes when you don't recognize why you have been given as much as you've been given. Because now you've turned a blind eye to the generosity of what God wants. But no, it's not a sin to have money. It's not a sin to be able to. So whether, whether you get it through a family inheritance, whether you work hard for it, whether you come into it out of luck, however you acquire your wealth, it is not a sin to have that. But again, the sin is not recognizing why God has given you what he's given you. The truth is God owns everything. And this is the last piece. It goes back to that ownership piece. And this is where we all struggle. We all struggle with this because we constantly struggle. Who owns what I have? And is God the owner or are you the owner? And the question becomes who? King David recognized the answer to that question very quickly. And David, in David's day, the king literally owned everything. The king owned all the people, the king owned all the livestock. The king owned all the real estate. The king owned all the wealth of, of whatever his country was. The king literally owned everything. In that power of knowing he owned everything literally, David recognized, as he writes in First Chronicles, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord is the kingdom. You were exalted as head over all. 
He continued a couple of verses down. Everything that we have has come from you, Lord, and we can only give you what is yours already. The people that I meet who have a trouble with this whole concept of generosity is the people that still have not understood that God is the owner. It's not you. It's not me. And the moment that that clicks in our mind, we begin to move from, from the thoughts of owners, meaning that, that I have to control everything and I have to decide and the responsibility is mine. The minute we move from being an owner to a manager, we are a manager of what God has given us, all of that changes. We stress out when we think we own. We have big hearts and we live with less stress when we step back and say, God, it's yours. Paul writes this to, to Timothy, and it's, it's a really important text. And Paul is sending Timothy out as his protege. Paul did not have children, but he often called Timothy his spiritual son. And Paul used Timothy to help with the planting and the restoration of a lot of the churches that Paul was responsible for starting in early Christendom. And Timothy was constantly being asked the questions of this new faith. How are we supposed to deal with this? Who owns this? Uh, what do you mean a tithe? All of these questions. Paul was commanding Timothy to teach on his behalf a lot of times while he was in prison, while Paul was in prison. Paul says these words in his uh, letter to Timothy, chapter 6. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Now, some of us will listen to that and say, well, well I'm not, it says rich. I'm not, I'm not rich. You are rich. You go and Google what the average income is of a world citizen and compare that to yours. You're going to find out you're rich, okay? So he's not talking about people that have lots of wealth. He's talking about all of us, you know. So he commands those of us uh, who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put our hope in our wealth. Remember what the, the man did with the barns, which is so uncertain, but they put their hope in God who richly provides for us everything for our enjoyment. And then he says this, command them to do good. Command them to do good. Don't suggest, don't kind of hint. He says, command them. Command them to be good, to be rich in deeds and to be generous and willing to share. If you're a person who is finding it hard to be unwilling to share, I want to urge you to check your heart with God today. You're in that wrestling match as to thinking you're the owner, and God is not. God is the owner. You're the manager. Switch that relationship. In the same way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Jesus says, Paul emulates in his words as well, that Living life is through the art and, the, and the, the fact of generosity. When we have a generous heart, we are mirroring the heart of Jesus. Some of us will say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe in all those things. He went to the cross and all that. But when it comes to time to be generous and to share what God has blessed us with, we draw the line in the sand. That's greed. We can't do that. If you truly believe the words that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, then that should have a transformative process on you. That God would give his own self to die for your sins. Why can't you and I give to others in need? Why can't we share what God has so richly blessed us with? If we believe Jesus went to the cross and that's the ultimate gift, why cannot our gift match that? You see, at St. Paul, these, these values are so important. And today, we've got to learn to move out of being owners of things and be back to managers, to allow the Lord Jesus to develop a generous heart within us. And whenever we generate that generous heart, we truly live into our value, that we believe that generosity is the heart of God. And we get to give. And that's the second part of that value for us. We get to give. Imagine what it would be like one day when, when Allison does an offering prayer, that instead of us all sitting there just listening to her pray like, okay, probably the message is coming next. I don't know. Well, what's going on? Where am I going to go? Can you imagine what it would be like when, when she talks about an offering prayer? 
that we all stand up and we just start cheering and we knock the roof off because we're just so grateful and thankful of what God has blessed us with, that we have the privilege to give back. Can you imagine what church capital C would be when God's people does something like that? Be generous. Be generous as Jesus is generous to you. And live into that as your value.